What's up? In this video, I'm covering zero shot text to image generation from the uh, OpenAI team or DALI for short. And uh, this uh, this work came out a couple of months ago, but I didn't see anybody covering the paper. So I thought walking you through and explaining in detail how this thing uh, works. And let me just briefly explain what DALI is all about. And as you can see here, uh, DALI can synthesize these awesome images uh, using just textual prompts. So on the left side here, we have, uh, so this is the, the, the prompt you're using and inputting into DALI. And so a taper made of accordion, a taper with the texture of an accordion. And you can see that DALI is able to remarkably mix up these concepts into something that looks like, uh, like, a, like a plausible drawing that a human would, uh, how, how a human could combine these concepts as well. So here we can see some kind of a, like a merge between the accordion and taper. Here we can see that the accordion has, uh, so this handle is kind of in the taper shaped uh, head. And yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, some other examples involve this one. So an illustration of a baby hedgehog in a Christmas sweater walking a dog. And just like focusing maybe on this one, it looks super amazing. Uh, like you, you can imagine this being used to generate uh, ad hoc logos or, or, or GIFs, whatever. So huge uh, potential like use cases for, for this model. Uh, obviously it does make some mistakes at moments. So here we can see uh, just a small hedgehog instead of a dog. So uh, here it's kind of the face is kind of blurry. So it's not perfect, but like it's a, it's a huge leap forward. And I mean, I'm loving it. Um, here we have uh, a neon sign that reads backprop, a neon sign that reads backprop, backprop, neon sign. So obviously you can see there is a lot of uh, like prompt engineering. This is something that somebody called it on Twitter, like uh, programming 3.0, uh, 3.0. So basically you had programming 1.0, that's your classical software engineering. Then you had programming 2.0, that's machine learning where your data is your program. And here you're, you're finally starting to just kind of uh, hack the the prompts in order to get the, the desired result from your model. And it looks like an emerging paradigm and we'll be seeing more and more of this with GPT models as well, etc. So uh, you can see results are pretty cool. You can see backprop here rendered and uh, I mean, pretty awesome. And finally, there are some like, uh, the, the, uh, like the this emerging property of, of image translation as well. So uh, basically, uh, they say here, so the exact same cat on the top as a sketch on the bottom. And in this example here, you can see it's I mean, it got perfectly it got it perfectly right. So it's kind of just extracted the edges from this uh, picture of a cat here and looks pretty awesome. On the other examples, it's not that perfect, but yeah, I mean, the very fact that it can actually do this without being explicitly trained to do th these kind of stuff. So this is just an emerging property, same as we had in, in GPT models where we had, uh, we basically trained the model to predict the next token. We got like something like machine translation as a side effect, etc. So yeah, same thing happens here with Dali. Uh, basically, and uh, having mentioned GPT, you can assume uh, that transformers and this is open AI. So you can just assume there is a transformer behind this and we'll get to that in a moment. Let me just uh, kind of touch on the on the one of the components of this of this of this model. So basically we have so Dali uh, consists out of two parts. So one is a VQVAE model, which I, by the way, I've covered in one of my previous videos, as well as VQ GAN paper, which is super similar to Dali paper, except for the, the GAN component. So I do recommend you check those out. I'll just link them somewhere here. Uh, but having said that, I'll briefly explain what VQVA is, is in this video. So uh, here, I just want to point out one thing. So VQVA is basically an autoencoder like, uh, so it's a VAE with uh, like a quantized uh, discrete latent space. And it, it has this like encoder like structure, right? So we have a bottleneck there, and then we reconstruct back the image. So this is your input image goes here, the reconstructed image, let's call it R, comes out here. So here you can see that this is the input image and after it goes through the whole VQVA pipeline, out comes this kind of blurry image. So the, the global like composition is still here, everything is still here, but you can see that it's blurry. And that's something you don't see with GANs. GANs have crispy, clear output. Uh, and here as well, so we have this text here and it's kind of blurred out here in the, in the reconstruction. And similarly for these squiggly lines, uh, some of them even get lost. So you can see here, 
we focus on this one, you can see that like it kind of totally disappeared. Okay, so it's not perfect, but like um, that the reason they do this is so they can model because it's really hard to model the image directly in the in the in the pixel space. That's the whole idea, and I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so. I mentioned transformers. Let's let's see. So this is OpenAI. Don't forget. So when compute model size and data are scaled carefully, all regressive transformers. So this is the original transformer paper, which I've covered in one of my videos. You can check it out as well. Uh, he have achieved impressive results in several domains such as text. So this is your. Th th these are the GPT family of models. So GPT one, two, and three. Uh, images. So this is your image GPT from OpenAI and audio. So this is jukebox uh, paper from OpenAI as well. So you can see a trend here. Uh, what they do is they, they take a different modality. So for example, text, they take a transformer, they scale the data, they scale the transformer and they get awesome results. And then we have images. Similar thing happened with images. So basically they also used a transformer. They modeled images directly in the pixel space. And the consequence was that they could only generate up to, I think, two, like 64 times 64 images. Don't get, don't, um, I may be wrong here, but I think it's something like that. So in any case, it's a super small resolution compared to, to nowadays we have generative models such as StyleGAM V2, where we have images that are like a, a million pixels, etc. Uh, so, and finally, we have audio. Uh, again, they used a similar approach to this paper. So again, VQ, I think they use VQVAE and a transformer. They scaled it up and they generate. They managed to generate some nice, uh, like uh, music, etc. Okay. So, question is, they ask is. Um, could dataset size and model size be the limiting factor of current approaches? So here we're modeling both the text and the image images jointly. And so they say uh, they train a 12 billion parameter autoregressive transformer on 250 million image text pairs. So that's it. So data plus big transformers, and you get awesome results. That's that's the the the, the main uh, like kind of light motif here. Uh, okay. So briefly. Uh, explaining the details of, of this uh, like pipeline that they have two stages in the first stage they train the VQVAE uh, model in the second stage they train this autoregressive transformer directly in the latent discrete latent space of the VQVAE so let's kind of just briefly touch on it as I said I have a whole video on this you can check it out uh, but let me just kind of briefly explain it so how you train this thing is you have an image, you, you pass it through this, this will be some kind of a CNN, so some kind of encoder. Uh, outcome, uh, these uh, these vectors, so you'll have, uh, for example, this will be like one vector here, and just this will be the other dimensions along this side. And what you do is you kind of snap that, that so this will be just a, like a collection of feature maps. Right, so you just uh, take this vector and you'll find the closest one in this in this code book of vectors. So this is just your embedding table. You find the closest one according to L2 distance and you snap it to that one. So you can see, for example, if this one was maybe the closest uh, code book vector was one, here you can see we snap it to one. So we have just a symbol one here, and then. Uh, later, you can just kind of index using these indices into the codebook vector, and you can actually find the actual vector. So you'll put E1 here, so that's this vector. So this vector will replace this one. And then you pass uh, these these vectors, th these quantized vectors, into the coder, which is also just some kind of transposed convolutions, and you get uh, the CN, uh, you get the the reconstructed image back. So uh, the loss is uh, fairly simple. They just have reconstruction loss, so they used MSC, so that's mean squared error. Plus they have some loss that encourages uh, encourages. Uh, the codebook vectors to be close to these vectors and these vectors to be close to codebook vectors. So uh, the one difficulty is it's hard to, it's not hard, it's impossible to actually uh, backprop through this thing because of this uh, uh, quantization step. And so what they do is they, whatever the gradients for these vectors here are, uh, they just copy paste those, as you can see this by this red line, you just copy paste those into the encoder. And then because this part is differentiable, you can just back prop through the CNN and uh, figure out all of the other gradients. But that's a difficulty. So this part because of the quantization, that's one of the main things they had to solve. And yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, in a nutshell how, how, how it works. So in my VQVAE video, I even went through some code. So if you're still confused how this exactly work, you can check it out. But that's the whole like a like a rough idea of how VQVAE works. So once you train uh, this model, so what you have is you have 
you, you train these embedding vectors, you train the encoder, you train the decoder. And so now the second step is this uh, transformer thing. So we concatenate up to 256 PP encoded, so that's by pair encoding uh, text tokens with the 32 by 32 uh, that's 1024 image tokens and train an autoregressive transformer to model the joint distribution over the text and image tokens. So this 32 by 32, let me just show you, show you where that comes up. So basically this means that this thing here will have 32 vectors here and 32 here. So we'll have 1024 tokens uh, like in total. And these are image tokens. So uh, those kind of capture the uh, information about the image and then using decoder you can just decode them back into the pixel space okay um, there's this part about where they mentioned elbow I think it's it will be more confusing than 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 good to explain this but if you ignore why for a second so if we ignore the labels uh, the captions sorry if we ignore the, the captions this is basically your your VAE objective so just elbow basically this is the LN so of P of X uh, uh, given Z, that's your reconstruction loss. And then depending how you decide to model your your data, so if you take Gaussian here, so basically what will happen is, uh, because Gaussian has some, some, some structure, something like this. So we have C, we have E raised to the power of blah, blah, blah. We have uh, basically X minus mu squared over something sigma doesn't matter. But basically when you do ln of this, so this is a constant, so we don't care. This is E, these two are, so ln and E are just inverse of each other. So you end up with X minus mu squared, which is your basically MSC loss. So that's how you end up with MSC loss, even though you have this abstraction here. And I know this part confused me, so hopefully this will like give you some epiphany moment. Um, and similarly here, uh, this is just a KL divergence between the approximate posterior and your prior. So that's basically your 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 uh, like VAE objective, and you're trying to to maximize this part because in turn, because it's a lower bound, that means you're you're gonna maximize the the, the like the likelihood of your data. So you just uh, kind of want to maximize the reconstruction uh, probability, and you want to minimize the KL divergence between those two. That that's just in a nutshell. Uh, I don't want to get into maths. Uh, as I said, the VQVA video has. Uh, better explanation of this of this component as well as some links to some cool blocks which you can check out at your own pace and understand the mathematics behind this. But the, the, the confusing part is you actually won't see the KL part especially in VQVAE uh, model. The reason being is that the KL divergence is constant in this model so it's kind of confusing to it's a nice thing to think about it like this but like for practi from a practical, practical standpoint it's just confusing. Um, Okay, so a couple of details uh, where VQGAN and uh, like VQVAE papers differ from Delhi. So um, I mentioned the straight through estimator. So that's this part. Let me go back here. So this is called the straight through estimator, this red line. This is basically your you copy pasting the gradients from the decoder over to the encoder so that you can back prop through the encoder and train your model. Okay, so that's the straight through gradient, uh, like a gradient estimator. And uh, here, so they say, we instead use the gumball softmax relaxation, replacing the expectation over blah, 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 blah. Uh, all in all, um, this is a modification they made, as well as the likelihood for the P sub theta is evaluated using the log Laplace distribution. So I mentioned, previously I mentioned this Gaussian here. So Gaussian leads to you uh, having MSC as an objective in the loss function. This thing, because they're using log Laplace, they'll have some different objective. And let me briefly go to the appendix and show you what I mean by this. Um, this is kind of different compared to other papers. And uh, I think it's pretty neat idea. So the L1 and L2 reconstruction objectives are commonly used when training VAEs. So L2 was what we saw. So MSC is basically L2 squared, right? And so these objectives correspond to using Laplace and Gaussian distributions for the this term, okay? And that's what I mentioned, so I explained the thing with Gaussian. Similarly, it goes with Laplace, uh, you'll have the same logic behind it. So you'll just end up with, uh, instead of square, you, you just won't have the square component. And uh, there is a strange mismatch in this, in this uh, modeling choice. Pixel values lie within a bounded interval. So your pixels will be in the like zero one range, right? That's your, that's your like normal RGB image. 
and they say here but both of these distributions are supported by the entire real line hence some amount of likelihood will be placed outside the admissible range of pixel values and so i just kind of draw uh like pasted the distributions here so your output pixel values will be pretty much here from 0 to 1 no matter how you parameterize this laplace so if you put mu to be equal to 0 0.5 so somewhere here you're still going to have some non-zero probability being given to values which are outside of the 0 1 range so this is the range we care about right the 0 1 range and the, these distributions, these assumptions that we have that the output, like uh, random variables are modeled as Gaussians or, or Laplace, simply do not make that much sense if you think about it. And that's why they, they replace this. So they say here, uh, uh, um, so we, we represent a variant of Laplace distribution, which is also supported by a bounded interval, uh, blah, blah, blah. So this PDF is defined on 0, 1 and is given by this this PDF, okay? So what it did is they just applied, uh, they say somewhere here, a sigmoid. Let me get just a sec. So yeah, so we consider the PDF for random variable obtained by applying the sigmoid function to a Laplace distributed random variable. And so instead of using MSE, what you'll now use to in order to do, to maximize the likelihood, the, the likelihood of your data uh, so to increase to, to decrease the uh, reconstruction loss, you just you'll just do log of this. So just ln of this term, and whatever pops out, that's what your objective will be like. And so that's in contrast with MSC loss. Uh, okay, and just this is the sigmoid. You have domain goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and we have the codomain, the the image being from zero to one, and that's the reason why the the random variable will now be constrained to be between zero and one. Uh, like contrast that to Laplace, as I mentioned, it it will have uh, values which are outside of the bounded region we are interested in. So that was just a small small uh, glimpse into uh, these uh, details which they, they kind of changed compared to the original paper, VQVA paper. Let me now get, get back to where it, we, we ended. I'll skip the explanation of the Gumbel softmax relaxation. I think it's just a detail and there is a whole paper behind this idea. So I'll have to skip it. But like uh, in a nutshell, they replaced the straight through gradient um, estimator with this novel Gumbel softmax relaxation method. And uh, now let's jump into stage two. Okay, so I mentioned uh, that after we train the VQVAE, we have a discrete space, and now we want to learn how to uh, train a transformer on top of that, of on top of those image tokens. And they say here, um, given a text image pair, we BPE encode the lower cased caption using at most 256 tokens. We woke up size of 16,000 and encode the image using 32 by 32 tokens with woke up size 8K. Okay. Finally, the text and image tokens are concatenated and modeled all regressively as a single stream of data. Uh, let me try and break this down for you if it's already not clear. But like what they do is, uh, so imagine you have you have a caption. So you have some, like I'll draw something like this. So we have a caption that's your some that's some text and you'll have associated image with that caption so something like this we'll have a squiggly man here random stuff whatever so that's your image and so what happens now is the following so they first lowercase this so let me just denote that as l then they do bpe so that means uh they'll basically tokenize the words into into some uh smaller units and what they have is they have this vocab size of 16K. So that just basically means you have a huge table here. And uh, that table contains contains 60, 16K vectors, which are learned. Um, okay, so now what this thing, how this thing will work like is the following. So let's say you have a sentence like, I don't know, like monkey, so monkey, monkey, king, and then we'll have whatever, like just three dots, okay? So this is your input sentence. And so BPE will just kind of break down your words maybe into some sub words, like, I don't know, you'll have maybe mon, you'll have key, you'll have, I don't know, maybe key I and ki. And so what happens is you'll just take this sub word, you'll find the appropriate vector, and you'll replace your sub word with this vector and etc. etc. 
And so what they say is they have max of 256 tokens. So that means if we have more than that, we'll just uh, kind of truncate. If we have less, they have some special like uh, tokens which they'll train for that particular purpose. Where where when we have like those when we have uh, a, like a less number than 256. But it's a minor detail. And um, so that's what happens with the text. So we have we end up with uh, 256 tokens here. Okay. Now the following thing happens with the image. So this one just gets fed into the encoder of the VQVAE, which was previously trained in stage one, and out come uh, 32 by 32 tokens. So basically, uh, this is 32 by 32, and you're kind of gonna unroll these, and so this will be your your target. So basically, you'll just put start of sentence token here. And then you'll basically all start of image, some special token, and then you'll just unroll this thing here. Okay, so you'll just unroll it here, and that's your input into your transformer. And what the output will be is the following. So this very same thing just shifted by one to the left. Okay, so you'll have something like this, and then you'll have end of sentence token or end of image in this case. Okay, so this that's it, and uh, so now how the whole thing works is you have a huge transformer. I think they used, I think like GPT-2 or something uh, with some sparse attention maps. And so you'll have a transformer here and then you have your like usual, usual, usual thing. You just pass this in, you transform it through the multiple layers of transformer and you'll want to predict these. So you'll want to predict this thing. Uh, from so from the start of sentence token. So in this case, these are image tokens. But Im just imagine for a second, this was uh, like a textual token. In that case, uh, if this was text, like Monkey King would have M here and would have M here, and then would the second letter would be O. So would have O here. So as you can see, you want to predict from the from the like this special token. You want to predict M from M. You want to predict O because O is the next one. So you're just trying to predict the next token. Uh, simple stuff, uh, pretty much, and you can do this in parallel. And that's how they train this whole thing. So this thing here will be 256, and this thing here will be 1024. And you just train this transformer to kind of learn how to, to do this next token prediction. And then how you actually use this later in inference is you just prepend this uh, caption and you prepend this special token like this one here. And then you just start sampling from the model until you get 32 by 32 tokens. You just pass that through the decoder and out comes a novel image. Uh, so that caption can be obviously completely novel. So the model has never seen that caption during training, like the the, the examples I showed showed you with Taper uh, and Hedgehogs. So yeah, that's how it works in a nutshell. Um, now let me just show you some some results they have uh, here. So uh, they compare they compare obviously the 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 Dali paper with different GAN uh, baselines. So like DF GAN, DM GAN attention again, etc. And here we have, so this is the ground truth caption, a very cute cat lying, lying by a big bike. And here we have the actual validation images, so the images that go with these captions. So that's the ground truth. And if you like take a look at the results, you can see two things. So first thing is, Dali has better outputs. Like it's just, if we focus on this thing here, a living room with a TV on top of a stand with the guitars sitting next to next to you, okay. And basically you can see this looks really cool, much better than GANs. Uh, the, the main difference is, uh, like VQVAE is, as, as we saw in the beginning of the video, has blurry output. That's why we have blurry, kind of blurry results here, even though their like composition is much better compared to GANs, where GANs are kind of, GANs are kind of the chat programmers of the generative modeling world, because they're super confident, they just output some values, super crisp, even though it's complete BS. And so on the other hand, we have VQVAEs, which have better composi compositionality, but they have blurry results. That's, that's something you can, you can, you can take off from, 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 from this image. Okay, let's, let's now continue. Um, one, one thing I want to mention is, and they actually explicitly mention it here, is getting to model, the model to train in a 16-bit precision past 1 billion parameters. And if you remember, they have 12 billion parameters. So they, they have 12 billion parameter transformer. 
without diverging was the most challenging part of this project. This just makes you appreciate engineering so much because if you think about it, the ideas in this paper are nothing brand novel. Like VQ Gan has super similar ideas, uh, Jukebox, all of these papers are kind of variations of each other. There is nothing super novel here. Uh, from the research standpoint in my like honest opinion, but like from the engineering standpoint There is a lot of things you have to solve in order to get this to work So one of the things wa was that they, they they had to train this in 16-bit precision and they had problems with overflow So they had to devise multiple techniques like this one here and they also had to do some engineering hacks in order to kind of avoid the memory bottlenecks they had on their GPUs so they couldn't fit the whole model. So they had to do this sharding uh, between multiple nodes, etc. So just keep that in mind. Um, I wouldn't say there is anything super novel research-wise in this paper, but just when you scale it up, when you collect the data, when you invest just a bunch of money, a bunch of engineering, like just a bunch of dev uh, like ours, you get you get some awesome results. And I think that's a valuable lesson. We don't always have to just invent novel ideas. Sometimes we just have to scale up and kind of push to the limits the current work we have. Um, what I have here is... Um, if you're familiar with Clip, if you're not, I, I also create a video on Clip, you can check it out. But um, basically what I do here is, they have this automatic way of filtering the output from the DALI. So for example, you generate uh, you generate 512 images from DALI. So we have a bunch of images. This is one, this is second one, this is third one, etc. So you generate a bunch of them. And then you have this model called Clip, which will, let me just draw it like, like a circle. So Clip will just basically, you input an image, and uh, you input a caption. So for example, this one, a group of urinals is near the trees. And Clip will tell you, so this is Clip. Clip will, will tell you how likely is this image to be under that caption, let's call it that way. So that means you can do uh, explicit uh, sorting of these images according to the scores that Clip model gave them. And you just take, you, you cherry pick the, 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 the ones with high scores and you can see the results here are pretty astounding. So if you just have, if you just generate a single image, you can see it's pretty random. It, you don't see even the urinals. Then when you have, when you generate eight images and you pick the best one, the best one according to Clip, you get better results. And finally, if you have 512 images, this one looks much better. So this one looks way better compared to the ones below, okay? So yeah, this just works. Um, it's just a heuristic to kind of uh, get some better results from these generating models. Uh, same goes from some different captions and that's the, that's the rough idea. Uh, again, check out the clip video if you're interested in learning about details how that exactly works. Okay, um, some additional results. They compare this to uh, this DFGAN baseline. Um, yep, they just get better realism and, and accuracy results compared to that baseline. Uh, nothing fancy there. Here they, so they show some results, some zero shot samples on this cup data set. This cup data set is basically consists out of birds. And the thing is, the, the, the original, that huge data set I mentioned that the, the DALI model uses has like a bunch of images, but the distribution of those images and captions is completely different compared to this data set. And they, they show some not that great performance on this, on, this, on this cup data set. You can see some birds here. It's not perfect. And uh, especially when you focus on these uh, quantitative results, you can see that uh, DALI is much worse compared to other baselines on that data set because as I said, it's out of distribution in a way, so it doesn't perform that well. Uh, what they do here on these diagrams is they, they plot the, the inception score and the FID, so that's for Shea's inception distance. Those are just some metrics which uh, people use in order to kind of try and quantify how good are the generated images because the problem itself is ill-posed, same as neural style transfer, same as deep dream, those kind of images you, you kind of, you, you don't have a clear cut way to determine which image is better. Uh, so these are some heuristics like IS and FID. And what they do is on, on the next axis, they have a blur kernel radius. So what they do is they kind of, whatever is generated out of out of uh, DALI and other baselines like GANs, uh, they just kind of blur them uh, with increasingly bigger filters. So you have, initially you'll have some, so you have an image here. And hopefully you're familiar with this. This is just some basic image processing technique. So you can create a kernel like a Gaussian and you just kind of, like slide over the image and uh, apply the the like the 
you just do the kernel operation the same as, as in CNNs. You just do uh, like element-wise multiplication. You add them up. You kind of map that to an output pixel. And if you do that with a Gaussian kernel, it'll just kind of blur the image. And what they then do is they kind of in start increasing these kernels. Uh, and so they ha they have a bigger one. And so uh, the, the the bigger the kernel, the, the, the more blurrier the image will be. And they show that when they kind of uh, blur the image, um, they, they get better results. So uh, this is the Lee, and you can see that uh, higher is better. And so the bigger the blur kernel is, the better the results we get from the Lee compared to other baselines. Here, FID should be smaller, so you can see again that uh, even here, after just uh, increasing the blur radius to one, we have better results compared to baselines. Uh, why do this? The reason is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, VQVAEs have problems because the outputs are not crispy, and so they suspect that these metrics may be penalizing them because of that. So in order to get on an even ground, they take the GAN output, they blur it, so as to compare, to kind of make it fair to, to DALI, and then they kind of calculate the FIDs and, and IS. I mean, th this is kind of a way to, I guess, measure the, like how high quality the composition of the image is uh, and put less focus on the actual details. I guess that's the whole point of this. On FID, uh, they show that the inception score is much lower, which is a bad thing. You want to have high inception score. And they show that the FID is higher. So that means it's having problems with the CUP data set. As I already mentioned, CUP is kind of different. Um, the distribution of data is different there. OK, um, here, pretty obvious um, fact. That's that when we increase the sample size for re-ranking, so that's the clip part, the more, so if you have 512 uh, generated images, that's going to be way better than you generating just a single image. As you can see here, the inception score goes up, the FID goes down. And so that means there is a sweet spot, maybe around 128 generated images, where you can then automatically select the best one. And this just improves the results on both metrics, FID and IS. OK, those were the results, I guess. I guess that's pretty much it. Let me just go back to the appendix uh, and show you one more thing. One more thing. So yeah, you can see the patterns in the transformer. They have just different patterns. They are not just simple causal masks. Um, and this was introduced in their sparse transformer papers. So you can check that out if you if you wish so. And I just want to show you some additional results on the image to image translation somewhere here. OK, so the exact same cat on the top color uh, on the top colored red on the bottom. So you can see here again perfectly image to image translation, even though this task so uh, you now know how the DALI model is trained. It's just trained to first train VQVAE, then you train the autoregressive transformer to just predict the next image token. And you can see that uh, out, out comes this, this ability to do this kind of stuff. As well as, so here they, they mentioned two panel image of the exact same cat on the top, a photo of the cat on the bottom, the cat with sunglasses. And you can see, again, like just placing some sunglasses onto the cat. Really awesome. Uh, results. I love this. Here with postcard, uh, the exact same cat on the top as a postage stamp on the bottom. Uh, pretty awesome results. And uh, with that, I leave you here. Okay, that was it. Uh, hopefully you like this video. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, subscribe, share out this, this content if you like it. That's the best way you can support me. And until next time, bye bye.